The Order of Light presents. We are the Disclosure, episode 25. With our guest, John Yost, as we explore the extraterrestrial phenomenon. Now is the time for those with experiences to speak. We are not waiting for the disclosure. We are the disclosure. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Robert Earl White with a new episode of We Are the Disclosure. Tonight's guest I'm extremely excited for. After watching his film, Alien Abduction Answers, I was absolutely blown away. For all of you that love this show, imagine if this show, We Are the Disclosure, was a Hollywood quality production with mind-blowing graphics, mind-blowing experiences, and unlike every other extraterrestrial UFO documentary you have watched, they all claim to know the truth or have some sort of answer, and more times than not, they tell you absolutely nothing. This film actually gives you some answers. And it also goes through the many layers of this phenomena. It's not just white. It's not just black. There's a lot of layers to it. And how John Yost presented this is absolutely incredible. John Yost is a uh, director, a producer, a screenwriter, an experiencer, and a lot of other titles. But at the end of the day, it's not about the titles. Right, John? You're right about that. We're people. Robert, that was the nicest introduction I've ever had in my life. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> you. and you're going you to make me blush. You're going to make me uh, blush. <laughs> but uh, just abs for everyone watching this, you have to watch this. It was so compelling. And I really related to John's story and what he's doing for the disclosure community is absolutely phenomenal. So, with that being said, uh, you know, John had quite a remarkable experience as a child. And once you hear it, you'll understand it. I don't want to give away all the good parts yet. Uh, but, you know, he's spent years in the film industry doing all sorts of things. And prior to that, he's had other reputable jobs. Uh, you know, he's not some guy that crawled out of a cardboard box on the side of I-95 and just, hey, I'm here to talk about aliens. <laughs> Well-educated, a uh, very strong background and all that good stuff. So, John, welcome to the show. And if you could, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background and what you've done? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Robert, for your time tonight. I really appreciate you and your show. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing, you're doing a real service for people. And um, it, it's, it's difficult out there because most people feel alone. And uh, you're reaching out and you're letting them know that they're not alone. And, and that's a, that really is some God work there. So, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a nobody. I'm just a normal guy. I grew up, grew up in a normal family. I went to school, went to university. Afterwards, I um, ended up working as a um, U.S. customs broker. Uh, we moved people and ideas, intellectual property and uh, money around the world, and dealt with every customs and treasury department of the world. I lived overseas in Germany. I lived in D.C. and New York and all around the country. And um, after about 10 years of that, I just lost its juice. So, you know, I mean, you're, you're busy and you're doing things, but then you just, your heart's not in it anymore. And so um, I had always wanted to be in the performing arts. And uh, I decided <laughs> after I was married and had two children that this was the most opportune time to do that. Uh, my mother-in-law, she, uh, she didn't agree with me and, uh, used very bad words, <laughs> <laughs> used very bad words, but that was about 25 years ago. Wow. And, um, 
I've been on camera many, many times, and uh, then that led to me being behind camera and and uh, writing and, and and you know and all the technical uh, aspects of film. And for the last twelve years, I've worked for a company called Rhino Pictures, and Rhino has been around for thirty-eight years, and they've done every kind of project you can imagine, everything from silly little commercials to long format to talk shows to sports shows and this sort of thing. And wow. um, and so I had been with them for quite a while, and about five, six years ago, I had suggested that we start to do our own content. Uh, because I thought that was the future of our business. And so we've done a lot of things for, you know, like uh, like things that would be good on History Channel or the Food Channel, that sort of thing, and worked with some of the largest producers and the lar largest streamers in the uh, in the country, Esquire, Fox. Um, wow. You know, yeah, big names. Sure. Yeah, big names. I mean, you know, we're a real company. That's my point. That's all I mean. Yeah. It's not. It's not two guys named Larry working out of a van. That's all I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were on a job, and this is where this story kind of leads us. You know, I mean, we were doing things that you would see, like true crime. You know, like on ID channel, you'd see stuff mm -hmm. like that. And um, we were on a job, and we were in a place called Borrego Springs, California. And for those who have never been there, it's very flat. It's very arid. It's a desert area. And we had rented this really big ranch house, a single floor ranch house. And um, we were doing a night shoot. And we had come back from the night shoot and we had about 15 or 17 people with us. And um, they had gone out in the back and they were going to have a nightcap. It's about one, two o'clock in the morning. And uh, I had finished working with the crew inside. We were downloading footage because we didn't want to lose it. You know, you always want two copies so you don't accidentally lose something in the airport, right? Anyway, I had come out and um, sat down, and we were going to have this, this drink. And I raised my glass, and there was this little glint in the glass. And, you know, your mind tries to associate things that you know and tries to make sense of it all. And I thought, oh, well, that's the moon, you know, glinting in the glass is the night. But then I realized, wait a second, there is, this is a new moon. You know, there is no moon outside tonight. This is why we shot tonight, because we wanted to control the light. And so there wasn't a moon. And as I drop my glass, I see right above the building, right above this one-story home that we have rented, this kind of oblong, it almost looked like an egg shape, and it was um, blue-green, it had its own luminosity, and my mind is racing now, I'm like, what the God's name is that? And it's close enough that I could have hit it with a baseball, like 30 feet, and wow. I, I, I'm saying to myself, that's got to be like a Mylar balloon, it's got to be like a get well balloon, or a happy birthday, I said, wait a second, it, that is as big as a Volkswagen. There's no freaking way. And I grab one of my camera guys, his name's Scotty, and I grab him and I turn him. And he looks and he says, oh, my. And just then, you know, I said we were surrounded by people. There were 15, 17 people out here. People are turning, oh, my God, what's that? Holy crap. What You know, all this other stuff. And just then, this thing moves. Robert, I'm going to tell you something. Lightning fast. Zigzag. And it stops right above my head. Now, I don't know if it was there for hours. I don't know if it was there for a second. But I felt something terrible. And I'll get back into that in a second. But then it zigzagged away about 20 feet, 30 feet away from me. And we're all looking at it. People are commenting on it. And then it just slowly drifts away. And like as I said, this place is very flat. So there are 15 so people here, and we're all watching it for about a minute and a half, two minutes, as it just drifts off to the horizon and blinks out. Well, everybody... Was, was oh, there sorry. light? Was the light on this, was it uh, self-emanating? It wasn't yes. blinking? It was a no. continuous glow? It was a continuous glow, and it was well, coming from inside. Don't do that. Yeah. yeah, it was coming from inside. And I was... Everybody was kind of humming. They were excited. They were a little afraid. People were saying, was that a UFO? What is this? You know, and I made some stupid joke about 
you know, having to get out of there, being the old guy on the team and, and you kids can stay up and drink, but I've got business to do in the morning, that sort of thing. But meanwhile, I was suffering. Um, uh, I was shaking so bad inside. I don't know if you or your audience has ever been so cold that they can't stop shaking. Or if you've, you know, vomited so hard or cried so hard that your internal organs are shuddering and you can't stop. That's what was happening to me. Wow. And I, I got back to my room and I barricaded the door with my bed and my luggage. And, you know, I'm a grown man. I sat in a corner on the floor and I cried. I cried. I wept. I cried ugly. And um, it was horrible. And the reason that I was having such a reaction was something had happened to me when I was a little boy that I never told a single soul about, except my parents, when it happened. When I was seven years old, uh, in, in the month of August, I, uh, my bedroom was on the second floor of my parents' home. They didn't have air conditioning. It was very, very hot. And uh, the windows were open. And I, uh, I awoke. Once again, it was like, you know, two or three in the morning, that sort of thing. It was very late. To hear this sound, it, was, it, it awakened me. It was an undulating kind of drone. It was like a... A hum. Yeah, like that. And so I, I sit on this side of the bed and I rub my eyes and I'm, I'm kind of irritated because this thing woke me up and I'm tired. And, and so I, I go to the bathroom and I get a glass of water, whatever. And I let the water run for a really long time. I don't know why. Anyway, I'm about ready to leave the bathroom and I open up the door. And right in the doorway to my eyes, as a seven-year-old boy, I am face-to-face -face with this character that I had seen on TV a thousand times. There used to be a show called Ultraman. It was a Japanese show. And uh, Ultraman was this giant. Uh, he was gray, it looked metallic, had a little bit of red uh, in his outfit, and he had these huge eyes. And he was a good guy. And he fought the bad guy. And, um, but this ultra man was my size and he was looking me right in the eye. And so at the beginning, I had no fear as this little boy. I went, holy crap, this is Ultraman, Right. And, um, so I was, the, what was, was it shiny like ultra man? No, it was dull. It was a dull oh, gray. Okay. It was a dull gray. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, we got very, very close in that doorway. And I mean nose to nose. And, um, and then something happened. I've explained it to other people like this. If you've ever stood on the beach and the water rolls over your ankles, and as it's going back out, as the tide is going back out, it starts to pull sand from underneath your feet, and you feel yourself starting to drop. And that's exactly the way it felt. It felt like I was losing control. I was sinking. And I, this is me as seven years old, I was petrified. I was petrified. And I started to flail like a, like a, like a, like a, like a drowning man. And I literally laid hands on this Ultraman guy. And just then there was this brilliant flash of light. And I felt like there was, I was moving, but I couldn't tell. And I couldn't really see anything except there was this blur of all these colors like red and green and blue. And, and they were moving so fast it almost felt like, like you were on a carousel that was moving way, way, way too fast. Or like when you're looking outside of a window of a bullet train and, and you just can't catch the landscape. And I'm moving so fast and I'm, I'm still in this struggle, I feel. And when I kind of came to my senses, I'm in the middle of this fight with this entity, this Ultraman guy, but something strange has happened. Our positions have changed. This Ultraman guy, his back is in the bathroom, and my back is in the hallway. 
well, I, I, I don't have time to think about this. I'm in the middle of you know, fighting for my life, you know, I, and I'm feeling this fear and terror and I'm throwing my arms and he raised his right hand. And he raised and he touched me on my left shoulder. And there was this flash of light and this energy hit me. And the way I've described it before is it's like if you're standing in the ocean about waist deep or whatever, and a wave comes up and it hits you in the chest, knock you right down. That's the way it felt. And it knocked me down. And I fell. And, and because I'm in the hallway now, facing the bathroom, there are these hardwood steps going down to the first floor. Well, I felt ugly. I mean, you know, it was it wasn't a controlled fall. I'm banging off walls, you know, I'm smashing my head, I'm falling all over the place. And I am I'm not proud of this. I was screaming like a banshee. Um out of fear, out of pain. And so my parents are awakened. They're on the first floor. And they come running around and you know, scream, What's going on? What the hell's going on? And I'm saying, Ultraman's upstairs, you know, you know, he's a, my father, you know, hearing an intruder, he bounds up the stairs, right? My mom's trying to hold me. I'm at the bottom of the stairs, and she's consoling me. And I am screaming and crying very loud. After some time, my dad comes back to the top of the stairs, and of course, there's nothing there. But he looks pissed, right? He looks upset. He looks tired. I woke him up. Yeah, I would and, be upset, too. Yeah, and he's frustrated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and so they take me back upstairs and uh, they do what parents do. You know, they look in the closet. See, there's nothing here. Look under the bed. Nothing here. Okay. So they put me to bed and uh, mom kisses me on the forehead and I zonk out. I mean, I am out for the count. I get a coma. Um, next day, I wake up and, re and remember. I'm seven years old. It's August and it's summertime, man. It's no school, you know, and, and kids are different today. But back then in the seventies, you were a kid, you woke up in the morning, it was summer. You went and played, man. You grabbed a waffle and ran the hell outside and you played all day. Mm -hmm. um, totally different today. But yeah. Um, but uh, I played all day, and I, my mom called me in towards the evening, and it was time for dinner, and she said, you are disgusting, because <laughs> I had been run, running all day. And she said, it's time for a bath before we have dinner, and I didn't want to. You know, I'm a little boy. I'm fighting it. She's pulled my T-shirt off, and she's looking at the bruises. Mm. And she gets to my left shoulder, and she says, honey, what happened here? I'm looking around. I said, Mom, I, I, I told you. I to told you it was Ultraman, you know. And she looked she looked really sad. She looked sad. I can remember that. And she said, it'll be okay, honey. It'll be okay. And uh, got a bath. What, what, what you can you say? Yeah, what, what, can, you, what yeah. can you say? What can you say? So, so, you know, so we, you know, we had dinner and I didn't think about it. You know, I'm, I'm seven years old. I I don't understand the import of what's happening. People keep saying to me, you know, well, why didn't you do this? I said, look, when you're seven years old, have you ever been picked on by a bully? Got your ass whooped? Of course you did. It happened once in your life. You didn't dwell on that, man. If you did, you'd curl up in a ball. No, you just did the next thing. Your, your memory's not, you're not gloating on that or you're, or, or, or you're moping on that. You're going on to the next thing. Anyway. So, I understand. Okay. I understand yeah. with my yeah. with my family situation. It yeah. wasn't like that. People ask me all these things. I was four years old. I Come couldn't on. even comprehend what happened, yeah. other than some sort of aircraft just exploded behind my house. Yeah. I yeah. You know, what are you gonna do? What What can you do? You shut up about it. So, yeah. It was a It was a big noise. Yeah. So my dad. A couple of days later, my dad's taking me to the doctor, and uh, as we pull in to uh, the parking lot he says to me now listen i don't want to hear any of this stuff about ultraman we we'll go in there you don't mention this you, you shut up about that and i said okay dad yeah um he didn't say it didn't happen he just told me to shut up about it yeah so i, so, I mean i love my dad and i wouldn't have done anything for him and i said sure you know once again i'm not understanding why it's so important 
Anyway, the doctor checks me out. He's looking at the bruises. It's been a couple of days, so they're starting to yellow, you know, that sort of thing. And he gets to my shoulder. He says, whoa, sport. What happened here? And I, I you know, I'm innocent. I'm a little kid. I'm, I said, well, you know, and my dad is in the corner. and He's looking at me. And I mean, you know, once again, it's kind of an age difference. You know, kids talk back to their parents now, but back in the 70s, yeah. You know, and my dad was a big man, a big man. And he looked at me and he gave me the look. And I, you know, I, and I loved my dad. Here's the thing. I, I, I totally adored him. Tough so, love. Yeah, but I, I totally adored him. I would have never crossed him. So it wasn't like I was afraid of him beating me up. I was, I was just like, oh, oh, I don't want to piss him off. Mm-hmm. So I just I got the look and I went, I, I was just, uh, you know, I fell. I got hurt. You know, I don't know. And so the doctor, you know, he manipulated it a little bit and, and you know, didn't bleed and, you know, and he asked me if it hurt. And I said no. And and uh, there was no no, no pain. There was no Even pain. after the next no, morning, no, the shower, was, nothing, no, no pain. No, no, no pain at all. No pain at all. And um, and so he gave me a lollipop and I walked out the door and I didn't think about it. My dad, we're driving home. We pull into the driveway in front of the house and my dad stops and he says to me, now listen, I never want you to talk about this altered man guy again. I never want to hear about it. I don't want you scaring your mother. I don't want you scaring your sisters. You shut up about that. He was pretty emphatic. And, and once again, you know, like I said, I was a kid. I, I had no idea why this was important. But I just knew that I loved my dad. And of course, I'd do whatever he say. And um, so I never talked about it. But of course, you know, throughout my life, you know, I played sports in school. You know, you're in the shower, your locker room, you're taking your shirt off. And you're, hey, Yos, what the hell's that? You know? And so I made up. I mean, it was just like, it was one of these things where I said, oh, yeah, I got, I got hit by lightning, you know, or a shark bit me or somebody shot me or whatever. And it was a quick laugh and then nobody said anything. And so it was an easy thing. And people say, well, why didn't you say anything? I, I said, well, you know, it was almost like muscle memory. You know, I've used this example. I see you're wearing a hat. You know, this morning you didn't get up and go, hmm. I am deciding to put on a hat. No, that didn't happen. You just Automatic. grabbed it. Yeah, you just put it because you feel comfortable and you like it. Okay, that's the way it is. Uh, or people wear spectacles or whatever. So it was. It just came out of my mouth. And then I, you know, I, I thought about it a couple of times throughout my life. You know, and anything would have been better than to say, you know, I was. You, you never wanted to do that because you would have been you know, a freak or whatever. So, I mean, it was never a thing where I, I forgot about the details because I could remember it clear as day. It was just one of these things that was pushed over there. Didn't have anything to do with me. Mm-hmm. And but John... This, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I Same situation, and I want to ask you, you know, did you bring this up up until a certain point? Did you talk to anyone about this? Because I did, I tried once in a while to a best friend. They would maybe believe me once they heard my mother. But even people I'd known for years, when I would tell them, you would see it on their face. They didn't want to hurt my feelings, but uh, there's no way they understood. So yeah. I understand where you're coming from. It don't work. It's yeah. it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. And well, did I, you, you didn't well, share it with no one. No. After your no. dad said that, that no. quiet. Yeah, for 45 45- you know, whatever years. And also you got to remember, you know, prior to being in film, you know, I had a very important job and I'm dealing with government agencies and, you know, they don't want any kind of loose cannon in there. You shut your damn mouth and you do your job. And I'm, I'm very good at my job. I'm very anal retentive. I check all the boxes, which makes me a really good producer because, you know, when you deal with other people's money or you're dealing with agencies or, or big, big, big companies, they want somebody solid. That mm-hmm. they can, you know, because there's a lot of money involved. And, you know, you can't be a jerk. So, um, so I've always been very good at it. Anyway, so fast forward to this day out in the desert. I've worked with these guys for 12 years. You know, they don't know anything about me. They don't know anything about that. And I, what happened was when that thing stopped above my head, 
I felt the exact same way I felt when I was that little boy and the sand was slipping on from underneath and I lost my mind. I lost my mind because the memories were always there, but the feeling, the visceral terror came back full force and hit me like I couldn't believe. It. And here's the thing, when I'm sitting on that floor, as that little in 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 my in my room, you know, as a fifty you know one year old guy, I'm not dealing with it like a man. I'm dealing with it like a seven year old boy who never dealt with it. It triggered oh, you. Oh my god! All of these feelings, everything, and it just and all the denial and every. Oh my god! It just crushed me, and I. It was so hard, and and here's the thing, because. Because I do what I do, and because I'm very anal retentive and very, you know, left brain, right brain, you know, boxes to me, I got angry because I'm losing control, you know, and this is pissing me off. And I want to control this thing, and I can't control. So I'm so, I'm sorry, I'm so angry at myself. And um, so the next day I hit the showers early. You know, I didn't sleep at all, and I go out there. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it. I'm gonna be in control, and I'm slipping up all over the place. And these guys who know me very well mm -hmm. and see that something's wrong. You were a wreck. You well, were off. And then also, immediately, what happens is this: I become deathly afraid of big sky and big water. I don't know. Never had that fear before in my life. 51 I, years old, 51 years meh. old, and suddenly, big suddenly, sky, big The very, ne very next day, I and this is a problem, I try to go out by the pool, I can't get near that pool, I can't get near it, and, and, so I've got to find other locations, you know, for the next couple of days, I can't go by myself, I'm petrified, Wow. so, so I get through the shoot, right, a couple of days, I get through the shoot, and I'm messing up, and people are seen, I, I drink a lot of Irish whiskey and I get on a plane and I go back east. But when I get off the plane, the family realizes there's something's wrong. Something's wrong with me. And um, it got so bad, Robert, that I would get to work early, like an hour early, and I would jump out of my car if I saw somebody walk in so I could walk in with them so I didn't have to be underneath the sky. Or I would... Uh, if I had to park far away, if I, I would run like a maniac, like, you know, some, I got all kinds of bad things to say about that, but run like a crazy person and get inside the door, just not to be underneath that sky alone. And, um, it was, it was paralyzing and it was frustrating me so much. If, if you knew me prior to this, you would say, John, what was going on? How, you know, it was like night and day and I was out, out so of angry. So out of character. So what happened was this. I, I thought to myself, you know, I'm a very self-reliant guy. So, I, you know, I guess a smarter person would have looked for a therapist or a psychologist. Or, but I couldn't do that. I, I had to figure it out myself, right? I had to figure it out myself. And so I started to read about other people. I figured, look, you know, if something like this happened to somebody else and they've dealt with it, I want to find out how they did it because I want to do that. And that led me to start to interview people. And that led me to interview people on camera and then start to share my details. And that gave me a little bit more courage that I wasn't alone. And then something happened. During the conversations, I remembered everything except that piece I told you about. Face to face with this Ultraman guy. Flash of light. Something happened, and somehow I got turned around, and my fa now I'm facing into the bathroom, and his back is in the bathroom, and my back is to these stairs. How the hell happened? What happened there? What happened there? And so this led me to want to go and have quantum hypnotherapy to really put those pieces together. And that's when I realized, I said, look, there have got to be Tons of people, and I find out there are hundreds of thousands of people who have had some sort of experience. More. more. Yeah. That have had some sort of experience they just cannot wrap their arms around. They don't understand it. And so I thought, you know what? 
this is worthy of a film. And, 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 you know, people have said all kinds of mean things about me in the film and stuff like this. And I just said, you know, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to believe or what to think or whatever. It, it's called Alien Abduction Answers because what it does is it gives landmarks to people. And if I can, if I can, you know, most people, they, they're in ignorance and they're in fear and they're quiet. They can't talk to anybody. So I figured, look, if I can ask the stupid questions, if I can look like the ass, if I can, they can follow me and, you know, sit on my shoulder, ride my pot, whatever. And, and really, that's the difference between this documentary. I know we're going to talk about the film a little bit and other documentaries. Most, it's true. Most, most it's films true. that you know, I mean, people who watch you and, and your podcast have seen a hundred films, a hundred films, but most of it. Are, are, are done by, you're done by, um, you know, researchers who are really smart people and tiptoeing. Yeah, and they tiptoe through this stuff, and what they do is allegedly, they use, yeah, possibly, yeah, by and, and they use these old clips, and you hear Walter Cronkite, you know, back in 1950s, whatever. But but as you know from the first frame of this, you're inside with me. You're living this. You're going to follow. You're going to see me fall down, look like an ass, see me triumph, see me find out answers, see me denied, see me cry, whatever. You're going to be there with me the whole time. So you don't have to be alone. And I think that's what's resonating with audiences around the country and Canada right now is people are saying, wow, this is different, you know. And, um, and, and so instead of these other documentaries, you, there's chock full of information that's really good. And you learn a lot. But with my film, it touches you. And you feel Emotional it. connection. Yeah. It really and, is. And, and, and you start to be, I, I tell people this, I say, you know, making this film was really a catharsis for me. It, it, it's given me a sense of peace. And all I really want to do with the film is to help other people. And, and hopefully they can have a measure of peace as well. So it's really, you, you can't touch you can't touch anybody and heal anybody if you're talking to their head. You got to talk to their heart, and the only way to do that is to put yourself on the line. And if you mm -hmm. look like a fool, you look like a fool. But people, you know, if you, you if know what I'm saying, you lower your shields and you show vulnerability, love, and compassion. People will respond in that way, and that's why you have these incredible people with incredible stories just as incredible oh, all yeah. coming forward relating to that and when you watch this just like you said john your um your vulnerability and just putting it out it is what it is that this sure. is how it's going down figuring it out yeah. it's a sense of humility and that's what people connect with and that that takes a real man to stand up and wear the thing that traumatized you to wear that and say on the public stage of, you know, Hey, there was something I didn't fully understand, but I want to understand it. That takes so much courage. Well, I would be remiss Robert, if I didn't talk about this, you know, a lot of people think that this film is my story. It's really not, as you know, it, it's, it, you know, there's so many other folks in here uh, really, wonderful brilliant people people with master's degrees people with their own businesses people who have design work around the country people who have global um uh, uh practices and and they are just as vulnerable just as honest and they're not old cases i mean there are a couple of things that we touch on just to give a framework historic it's framework. new it's, it's new. all new it's all new these are people they never heard of and they're not tinfoil hat people. They're, this is one of the things that people have said to me. Um, they say when they, when they watch the film, they see themselves or they see their uncle or their dad or their mom or their brother or whatever because these people represent them. And they're just as vulnerable, just as honest, just as credible. And, um, and they're all so brave. And I, I truly i am totally in love with those folks uh, for doing that. And, and, and let me tell you this also, Robert, none of them got paid. Every single one of those people said, look, this is important enough. 
And, you know, and for people who think it's easy, let me just say this to you. One of the reasons that you've kept quiet, not you, Robert, but other people you've kept quiet is because you know this is not a resume builder. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the stockholders of General Electric haven't called me and asked me to be their CEO, right? <laughs> They've said, hey, you're that UFO guy. No, that's not the truth. Yeah. Because <laughs> people are like, what the hell? So it's a hard thing to do that. It's a really difficult thing to do that. That's why when I was a pastor, I didn't talk about these things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. how, how could I? You, you sure. can't. It's a job ender. Eventually, that's what got me kicked out. I talked about my experience with a being. They called me a demon. That was that. <laughs> so, I mean, you're right. To talk about these things, you lose everything. Sure. And you put all your time, your sacrifice, your money into this. Yeah. There's nothing to gain except one thing, helping others overcome their experiences. And that's what your film is doing. And John, before we talk more about the film, yes, sir. Ultraman, all right? Oh. I just want to bring up, and I, I want to hear that after you had this regression, I would mm. love to hear more about what was really going on. But before we get to that, there's a point I want to bring up and uh, something I kind of was putting together. Sure. When you were describing this feeling of this being pulled in the sand, I've talked to a lot of other guests on my show who have had some sort of out-of-body experience, astral projection, or alien abduction. Yes, sir. And they described word for word long before the, your film was out, but the same kind of motion, like they were at a beach being sucked out to the sand. Actually, episode 14 of We Are the Disclosure, I have a girl from Slovenia saying the exact same thing, but it was in wow. dream state. Wow. And she described it just as you did, like she was, but uh, the English translation sure. of her speaking our language, but she was trying to say exactly what you were saying. That's now, it. After talking to all these people, what I've come to learn of that is a, a frequency manipulation of some sort. Was it you going through this Ultraman uh, being, or was it the frequency being altered or manipulated due to whatever this being was and you were feeling that? And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because you said you had the same feeling first time when you saw that craft so close to you, except that time you had... 14 other people around you watching it. Yeah. So um, it's just something I notice in between the two stories and your description matches identically others I've talked to this, except you're, you have a really great way with, with words. And in the film, you have an amazing way parables. You're really good at taking big complex things and explaining it so simple <laughs> and uh, I've just made to myself. That's why. <laughs> and, and I'm all right too. I mean, the the, pa the pastor days, you know, all pastors speak in par uh, parables. But sure. you know, uh, it's it, it was just one thing that kind of stood out to me. And uh, I know you're going to get more into that. What happened after your uh, regression therapy? But sure. it's something interesting. What are your thoughts on that? I well, e even through the. the progress of the film because when you watch the film you're watching real time meaning that the things i did i did in order and you're seeing okay this is what i did next and this is what i did next and this is what i did next. it's not like we shot everything and then switched it around and no no um so i during the film i had no kind of idea of you know the vibration and the changing the frequency i had no concept Today, oh, wow. today, at the end of it all, I am continuing. In fact, uh, yeah, I know I'm jumping the gun, and I apologize, Robert, but I'm working on, a, on the next film, which is Alien Abduction Awakening. And part of those concepts, part of that idea about frequency and, um, and dimensions and this sort of, this will be something that we discuss in the next film uh, because it's, it, it's a maturation process, you know, um, this first film is 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 really I I didn't know it was going to be like this, but it's designed um, to to take people where they are, and where people are. This world really is ignorance. I don't mean that in a 
pejorative way. I just mean that and most people just don't understand or don't know. And because they're in ignorance, it develops fear because you're in a void. You don't, you, you know, and so you have the ignorance and fear to some measure of understanding. I'm not talking about complete comprehension. That's come on. No man. one knows I, that. I, yeah, I don't know that. You don't yeah, know that. I, you know, and anybody who claims that is a jerk and you, you should run. avoid them. Yeah. You run. Yeah. I've always said that. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. run the other way. Absolutely. No one knows the truth and we never will. That's why That's these right. beings are traveling the universe, still studying things. Yeah. No one knows. No one knows. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, you know, to that measure. The second film is to take it from that idea of having some sort of understanding to integration of that information. Meaning, if if you know certain things now, if you know some of this stuff, like if you know, if you touch the oven, you can burn your hand. You don't do that anymore, right? Or this is the button that turns on the heat. Okay, now you know that. Now you can integrate that in your behavior to explain or explore more. Okay. And then the third film that I'm working on is called Alien Abduction Ascension. Now I know that sounds real woo woo, but all I mean by that is this is, you know, when we're born, we, we're prone and we crawl and then we start to hobble and walk and then we run. And, you know, and, and so it's, it's a maturation process. It's, it's a, it's an evolution for us in our minds and our spirits and our consciousnesses. And this is what I'm, I'm trying to do because this subject is so rife with fear. You know, a lot, uh, some, of my, some of my critics yell at me about, the, you know, oh, you put too much. I said, listen, if you ignore fear, you're going to lose two thirds of your audience because fear is number one, what we all experienced in some way, shape or form or other. Or number two, this is what the press and movies and everything else have jammed on our throat. So this is where this is the space that people live in. We got we got to start there. The lack of understanding, as you said, yes. leads to fear. The mainstream is only putting out the fear part, but not the understanding. You're doing a step. You're building a ladder for people that have had these experiences, not for, you know, the uh, skeptics and all that to help people to move on. OK, you have this information. What do you do once you have this information? Right. What's the next step? And you're going through them. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to go through it real time. I'm trying to figure it out. And, and look, you know, I fail. I fail. Me too. I, you know what I mean? Um, and, and I pick myself back up and I keep trying because I really, here's the thing, even in the trailer, you know, I say at the end of the trailer, I said, you know, even if I had to live with the fear, I need to know. I have to know. I really, and that became, my need to know became greater than my fear. For a lot of people, they say, oh, that's too, tough. I can't even touch that. Or they say, look, it doesn't, it's not affecting my life now. So I don't want to go there. It was tragic and, and I'm going to put it behind me. But the truth of the matter is, is that it affects you no matter what, even if you don't think about it. And it's affecting things around you that you might not suspect. And so this is why it is so important to me personally. And uh, I think it's important to a lot of people privately. <laughs> I think, you know, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help those folks. Anyway, Robert, where do you want to go from here? That That's well said. That's what it comes down to, helping others. Where do you want to go from here? You can keep burying it. I have family members that are still kind of hush-hush about it. But I know that it, on a deeper level, it affected them. And there's sure. a reason they do weird things like hide in their closet during lightning storms. That There's a reasoning. It's because they're neglecting these experiences. And you and I, we're creating a safe space and yeah. encouraging others to come forward and share these experiences. So from there, yes, um, now my, my mother... She had a lot of screen memories where gray extraterrestrials were mongooses, draconian <laughs> reptilians were large snakes, uh, uh, hybrid containers and UFOs were compared to hamster cages with uh, eyes and lights going all over them. DNA strands were c compared to uh, bread twist ties, red and yellow uh, orange twist ties. 
Wow. Really weird screen memories. And when I first heard your story about this Ultraman and you're describing it and the gray, and then I know Ultraman was really, really tall. And you said, but this Ultraman, seven year old you, was the same height. Yeah. And then you're having this frequency situation. I want to know after you had regression and you went back and revisited to this. I mean, your whole entire life you had the mark, which I, throughout this I'm showing. I'll show the picture yeah. and all I still that. Have, yeah, I have it today. Yeah. And you still have it, and it's very bold. It's some oh. serious, serious yeah. scarring. It almost looks like a gun. I've had friends that have been shot. It yeah. almost looks like a bullet wound. Yeah. It, it it's serious, but it's a weird scarring. It's not quite the same. So I would love to hear uh, what you discovered through your regression. What was this experience? What was going on with that? Sure. Well, I, I let me say this about a, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I um, I don't want to say I poo pooed the idea of regression. For me, remember, I, I've been telling you throughout this this conversation, I, I'm very self reliant. So I was pissed off that I couldn't remember, and I was angry. And this was my last, my last ditch effort to find out what it was. I was clueless. And um, and and through these good people, I met this woman named Deb Shakti, and uh, Deb Shakti has a, a, a global practice. And she is, um, I mean, I, especially as a preacher, you, you, you're very familiar with this term, Christ consciousness. She, mm -hmm. she is a, a true angel. I mean, honestly, a, a service to others person. And uh, I, I, I've come to just love her like a sister. She's a wonderful lady. And, um, and she said, look, I'm not going to do anything, John. All I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to relax because you're an uptight guy. <laughs> and I said, really? Really? <laughs> really? Relax? I don't know what that is. You can try, though. Let's see. <laughs> so yeah. I, said, I said, really? The and guy uh, running from the sky yeah, the guy, is I, not I, that relaxed. I, I'm not going to be relaxing very much. No. Anyway, <laughs> that's funny as hell. <laughs> Robert, you're killing me. Um, so, so I, she said, all I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to relax enough to walk down the hallway that you created, John, and walk into the room that you built and walk up to the filing cabinet that you created and open that drawer and just look at what you put in there. And all you're going to do is you're just going to tell me what you see. That's it. That's all we're going to do. So we, we had a couple of um, a practice sessions, uh, and we didn't talk about any of the stuff that we wanted to talk about in the film. It was more just like, could I relax, you know, uh, take me to my favorite Christmas, you know, take me was, to... Real, real, oh, real quick, real quick, yeah. important question. Yeah. Was she aware of the Ultraman story before the regression? Yes. Yes, okay. she was. Yes, she was. Okay, good, good. That, that's it. Please yeah. continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I told her, and then I told her specifically what I was looking for, that piece. And she said, okay. She said, that's fine. And so she was very careful uh, with her wording and make sure she didn't lead me or anything. Like I said, we had a couple of practice sessions to see if I, I, I could or if I would fight, you know, going under or relaxing. And, um, and so when it came time for the actual session, the session was like six and a half hours long. Now, in the film, of course, it can't you can't show the entire session. You know, it was really quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there was a bunch in there. There was a bunch in there. But the truth of the matter is, it was six and a half hours long. Um, and uh, so all the cameras were set up, and then everybody got the hell out of there except her and I. You know, they left the rooms and locked all the doors and everything else. I was wondering that. I was yeah. thinking that when I was watching. I was like, yeah. were all those camera guys around or did Nobody they give them there. the privacy? No. No, we did We did a sound check. We did a camera check. And then everybody said, okay. And they pressed a button and walked out, shut the doors and locked them. Wow. Wow. And, um, and so we went for it. And, um, and so there was a lot that was said and encountered 
and uh, there's a lot that's still going to come out in the next films. But but what what I can tell you is in this film is this is that number one, it was not the first time I had been taken. I've been oh. taken several times before. Um, and secondly, I had not been taken by a gray or a reptilian. I have been taken by, the best I can explain, some sort of insectoid, some sort of ant-man, if you will. He had, had antennae coming out of his cheeks and his head. And, um, and I was not taken to a ship. I was taken to something that was subterranean. I could tell there were stalagmites and stalactites. It, it felt dank and, 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 and there was moisture in the air. And there were other entities there, and they resemble greys a little bit, but their faces were elongated, almost like horses. And um, and I can tell you that the, the the colors that I saw were these ginormous screens that were surrounding me, kind of semicircle, and they were speeding and speeding, and there were images inside, images inside, images inside, images, and. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you something funny. Uh, as and this was tragic because it was very hard for me to watch, but I laugh at it now, thinking about who I am. Remember, I've been telling you about how anal retentive I am, you know, all throughout my life. Well, as a little boy of seven, you know, think about what you're learning in school. You're, you know, you're you're putting words together and reading little books and this sort of thing. Well, I was ticked off because these images were moving from right to left. You know, and we write English from left to right. And I was mad that they were doing it wrong. <laughs> I was so ticked off that they were doing it wrong. I was mad at the aliens. Um, so, you know, I was a perfectionist even then. And, uh, but what, what also was is the information was not in the images. And, I, and, and you know how you're talking about advanced ideas about frequency and things like that. Some things that I'm, 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 I'm realizing now afterwards is that, in fact, this was done specifically to pull my conscious mind out of the way so the real information could be downloaded to my subconscious mind without interference with my conscious mind. So, I mean, a really brilliant tactic. Um, the images their, on, are worked in there in order yeah. to allow the process to yes. occur. Yes, yes. Wow. A really brilliant, brilliant move. Um, I, I, I never thought of that until after the movie was out. I, I just been thinking about the next film and what I want to say about it. And, and um, just anyway, uh, and also something that came out and it's actually in the film and you know, is this is there is, you know, today people are so, they are so focused on being right. Yeah. They don't care about being correct. Right. So, you know, I, I've teased in other interviews where I said, Let, just go to Twitter, you know, and say, happy Wednesday. And you'll get a thousand people who say, what do you have against Tuesdays? And then another thousand people who say, Thursday denier. You know what I mean? What, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You just want to fight because you want to fight. Okay. And no so, one can be right if everyone's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So uh, I, I'm just, anyway, kind of lost my train of thought. But what I was trying to say was this, is that there is right now so many people are, for the first time in their lives, playing with the idea that we're not alone. I mean, credible people. Incredible people. I mean, you know, hell, people in government are us, you know, and people who are behind the pulpit are us, you know, we're people that make more money than us is yeah, what you're trying to yeah, say. Yeah. <laughs> How about this? People with a microphone, a bigger yeah. microphone than us. Exactly. The, those people, those people finally have said, uh, what? Or they finally went, oh, they know. Oh, yes, I've been studying it for years, you know, this sort of thing. Anyway, um, and so. It, <laughs> This this is this is coming out, but still, there's a lot of back and forth, and what does this mean? And everybody's focused on this tech. They all want to know about the tech, 
and the physics and you know class one society class two civilization this sort of thing this is this is the topic and i and i i don't understand you know maybe i'm not a smart guy i but i think there's a difference between being intelligent and being wise mm -hmm. you know if you had robert if you had a motorcycle that went 100,000 miles an hour okay but you were a nice guy and stopped at every stop sign and helped little old ladies across the road and you were a good person everybody loved you nobody would give a damn about your tech but right but so so for me for me who who's driving these things what is the intelligence behind it what are the motives the agendas I could give a crap. Look, I could have, you know, it's like one of those comments about, you know, guns kill people. Guns don't kill people. Some jerko that pulls a trigger kills a person. You know, drunk drivers kill people. Cars don't kill people. Okay. Yeah. So, so tools. tools. They're just tools. tools. They're just tools. Not Listen, good, not evil. No. Tool. A boulder tool. is a tool, right? If I pushed a boulder off a side of a hill and it rolled on you and it killed you, guess what? It was a tool for death. So it, they're just tools. And so I'm, I am, I say this about like all of these documentaries out there. I, I've really enjoyed them. And I, I have a lot of friends out there now who we know each other and I promote their films because I said, look, you guys are all about what and how. I'm about who and why. Mm -hmm. Because that's the complete picture, right? There's more to it than just the tech. You know, that's why I say, you know, this 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 message that I have is it's and I, I know so many people are so fired up because it's it's all about that CE5 and, and, and making contact and seeing like God bless you. I, I, I totally crazy and great and fantastic. But there's something more. I mean, Way are more. you are you contacting the lights or are you contacting the consciousness behind the lights? Of course you are. So it's got to be more. It's, so I say it's more than just the shiny lights in the sky. It's about us. It's about our souls. It's about our consciousness. And, and, and this is really what matters to me. Because you could have that motorcycle. But who you are as a person is probably going to determine whether or not you're going to run me over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or give me a ride. <laughs> Spirituality must evolve and go with technology. If one or the other becomes yeah. out of tune, society will fall look apart like, from look, it. Look, look like ours. <laughs> we'll look exactly. like ours. Yeah. And what you were saying, uh, there's a reason you used the Whitney Schreiber quote. It's called communion. Yeah. That, that, that was a great quote to use, you know, yeah. in the yeah. film. And that's what he was talking about. And I, I have a question for you going back to the experience. Sure. Go, ahead. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Now, this underground facility, to the best of your knowledge, was that on this planet or an exo mm. world? To be on, I am telling you, my friend, I have no clue. The but only underground. Other, yeah, it was underground. The only other thing I can tell you is that at the top, it was, it was, it was, re when I say it was big, I mean, imagine yourself, you've, you've played in a, in a big band. So, you know, like if you play a stadium, right? And you're in the middle of the stadium and there's nothing around you and all the lights are out and this stadium had a top, okay? But it had a hole at the top. That's the way it felt. You were in this big. gigantic cavern and at the top there was uh, a hole, but it was irregular. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like if it was metal, it'd be perfectly circular. What, it was irregular. What color was the light that was coming through that it, hole? It was dark. I could see it was sky. I could see that it was sky, but it wasn't. I, I couldn't tell what it was okay. or where I was. I couldn't tell. Wow! And yeah. these beings that you saw, which yes, you sir. said you saw some that, what you would say that some people would call grays, but not what they typically think of about a gray. They had very yeah. elongated faces, which yeah. I'm familiar with ones like that. And also, there's a lot of different kind of creations and hybrids and mix up sub things and the insect toys that you were talking about and i want to bring this up john i have to all right so 
so interesting you're talking about being underground obviously in some sort of cavern or cave or complex yes, underground you're yes, seeing sir. these insect toys that kind of look humanoid kind of mixed with the gray with these antlers and antennas if you will whatever yep. Yep. i i don't know exactly what they are honestly speaking but um it's funny that you say this because my native american ancestors i've been to my ancestors petroglyphs i've seen petroglyphs that only five people have seen i was with some of the elders i can't say their names they want to be but very sacred lands and i went to the rocks and my ancestors carved these beings on the rocks and they have a story about them and that story goes something like hey they're coming up out the ground and some have called them ant people but our ancestors just called them great spirits in the same way that you're not giving an exact name who they are where they come from my ancestor just they call them great spirits now we can all speculate all day that these great spirits are a lot more than <laughs> great spirits and especially when they have the technology that they do and uh how they operate and things like that but I just wanted to make that point that they, there are a lot of carvings around the world that are describing these things that look like insect toys or gray extraterrestrials that have antennas, antlers, and other appendages. It depends. They're all kind of different. So when you were with them, if you could add anything else about their description, uh, did they communicate with you at all? Mm. Big question. I know everyone has. Yeah, telepathically, um, of course. Yeah, um, I, I refer to the antlered ones, the antenna one, as their bully, and that's you know me as a seven-year-old kid saying that mm. you know, and so that made sense to me. Uh, the other ones, they didn't talk to me, but everything was imagery. Everything was imagery. Um, it was a uh, color, it was emotion, it was sound, it was vibration. And so, um, Oh, quick question. Yeah. Look, you just mentioned sound, but yeah. as you were going over, was this the same sound as when you were seven years old or was this a different sound you were hearing? Well, remember that happened when I was seven years old, the abduction. Okay. Yeah. So it was that sound. It was yeah. that sound. Okay. Well, I got yes, it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so, you know, there was no, there was no, hey, listen, Johnny, this is what the deal is. No, that wasn't it at all. Okay. Uh, and there was no, there were no words that came through in my mind. That, and you, know, you were that, just standing there. Just... No, no, no. I was kind of, um, it was, it was strange because um, I was kind of almost like reclined and I couldn't move except my head. Oh, um, like but, in a chair? Like in a chair, but I don't recall being in a chair. I recall being suspended, like like uh. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was kind of frozen, and 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 I'm I didn't want to look at these things, and I'm I'm looking over at my shoulder, and I could see the other beings moving, and I could see their faces and outlines of their bodies and this sort of thing, and um. But I was, I was, you know, I mean, you could move like this, but you were kind of forced to. And these screens were like this, so they were semicircle. They really took almost the, like a hammock effect. For yes, sir. I, I yes, remember sir. seeing it in the film. You had like yeah. a black little hammock kind of yeah. thing, but yeah. because it sucked up around you, you can't yeah. really move. Just move your head left and right. I got it. Wow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So. So you're seeing these things, no sort of communication. You had these pictures that were acting as like uh, almost to say to take down the shields in our consciousness in order to add information mixed in yeah. with these millions of images within images. Yes, so sir. important that you say that. Yeah. Um, and from that, was there a message that you got from yeah. this? imagery download yeah um there, there's there's a there's a bunch of information but the 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 line that i was i was coming to we were talking about you know people fighting and being correct and whatever and there are a lot more people interested in the topic now 
in my lifetime, there is going to be a series of events that there could not be any doubt. There, you know, people talk about disclosure all the time. Well, you know, why don't they just land on the White House? They already have. They already have. It's disclosure. already happened. Yeah, yeah. Disclosure's already happened. It's just people in general, I through whatever reason or whatever means or whatever defenses or whatever newscast or whatever have hidden behind these things or obfuscation. But what's going to happen is no one is going to be able to doubt that we as a, as a species are alone anymore. We will not be alone. People will know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, and the way I describe it towards the end, I said, look, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be frightening. It's all of those things, all of those things, because some people will be able to handle it. Some people will not be able to handle it, you know. And, and growth is painful, but it's a part of the process, like yes, a sir. crab losing its shell or us yeah. growing and losing our teeth and getting big boy teeth. You know, it's yeah. the same situation. Growth takes a, it's challenging. Yes, For sir. Sure. Yes, sir. Wow, that's a beautiful message. Very beautiful, no doubt about it. And like what you're saying, you know, disclosure happened for you, John, when you were seven years old. Although you didn't understand it, technically, that's when it started. I'm sure through recovering more, there's been probably stuff before and after that, which we could save that someday for a part two when you release the second film. <laughs> got, got to save, got to save some. Can't give all the spoilers away. Yes, uh, but, uh, you know, and for example, me, disclosure happened when I was four years old and this UFO crash. So, you know, like what you're saying, and that's why this is called We Are the Disclosure. We're not waiting around for some no. guy in a suit and tie to tell us what no. our own experiences are. You know, it, yeah. they're there, and it's already happened, and 10 minutes a night, I tell everyone, 10 minutes a night, go outside, look up. You will see something. That's all it takes. So you're bound to eventually, because no. stuff is cooking up, more now than it's ever been and uh that's a very positive positive message for humanity and a little hope and thank you so much for sharing that and i can clearly see that you're on your mission no doubt about it helping others get out there sharing your experience and trying to get to know the experience know the person know yeah. the the trauma the fear the laughter the happiness that is associated from this experience and john i have one question for you and a lot of people i've talked to we all relate on this but sometimes the thing that was honestly the most terrifying about your experience my experience my family's experience all my guests experience isn't necessarily the experience it's the rejection that we face when we go to share that experience is actually worse than the actual terrifying seeing something we don't understand. When you completely don't understand something, you do one of two things. You fear it or you stare at it in awe and amazement and you think about it 24-7 wondering what that was if you're using your logical part of your brain. Yeah. So uh, with that being said, you know, what? what's, uh, you know, have you felt that was what was harder the the fear of rejection or the actual experience itself well for me for me they they both had their own pain their own separate pain um for me uh, it was unresolved pain and it's interesting too because the reason that i lied about it was not because i was afraid of it it was because I was told by people to shut up. I was told by people to lie, you know, and I think that's, that's a very poignant um, observation on your part uh, and some of your guests part about, uh, you know, how we inject ourselves, our egos into these problems, because the truth is, and, and, you know, I, you probably heard me say this before, you know, and I, I get some guff for it. You know, people talk about my truth, my truth, my truth. 
I'm an old guy. You know, if you would have said that back in the 60s or the 70s, they would have said, well, that means you have an, a, you have an opinion that no one else shares. You know, but, but, the truth, but the truth is, you know, either we're alone or we're not alone. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So you can dress it up. You can put icing on it. You can do all kinds of things. You can reject it. You can lie about it. You can, you know, believe it with all your heart. But it won't change the truth. You know, you and I, 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 I've used this analogy before in other conversations. You and I were standing up on top of a hill and it's midnight and we got these, you know, night vision glasses and some bad guys are coming up over the hill. So what I do is I don't want to face the truth. And I'm afraid of those guys. So I take off my glasses and I say, whew, man, I really dodged it. Thank God they're gone. <laughs> right? I'm about, exactly. to have a, I'm about to have a very bad night, right? <laughs> so, it doesn't change the fact that they're still there and coming towards that's you. That's exactly right. Reality. I've always used, yeah. uh, you know, uh, wind, oxygen, the air. No one sees it, but we no. all feel it. Yeah. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. It is your Wi-Fi. All right. No yeah. one sees Wi-Fi flying through the thing, but we use it every single day. Just because yep. you don't see something doesn't mean that it's not there. That's, That's right. And so exactly. now we're catching, we're catching this stuff now in military cameras, better and better and better. And and, te- and our tech is just catching up. You know, uh, the analogy I use is, is you know, <clears throat> before Pasteur, you know, people got sick because they were evil spirits or whatever. You know, they start to see through this microscope their germs and, you know, and viruses and bacteria. So here's the question. You know, before the microscope, was there bacteria or did it just it was just created for the microscope? No, it's always been there. And see, this thing is, is that this phenomena and these phenomena have been around us since the beginning of our creation, since the beginning of creation. And, and we before. have before and before. And we have seen it through the different filters of our senses and our beliefs and our minds and all this other stuff. But the truth is, it's there. Now, there are different sources and different, you know, and I, you talked about being a preacher and people saying they're demons. Look, I, I don't disagree with those folks. I don't say, listen, no, those angels and demons. Listen, if somebody treats you pretty badly, I think you could probably call them a demon. If they, call, if they treat you really nice, you might call them an angel. You might be wrong in both cases. By the yep. way, you know, if you're if, if your parents were very strict with you, I'm sure you had at one point a, a moment where you said, I hate my mom or I hate my dad. Yeah. But they love you with all their hearts and they're trying to help you. So, you know, everybody puts themselves, their own ego into the mix. And then this is where the objective observation stops. And that's why fear needs to go to the wayside. Because mm-hmm. because unless we unless we do that, we're always going to see this phenomena through that fear. Now there might be there might be reason to be be cautious. Okay, that's fine. You know, I mean, look, you know, a, a tiger, a beautiful animal. There's reason to be cautious. Okay, mm-hmm. it's, re- it, it's reasonable to do. But you can't be petrified and yeah. not do the right thing. You have to be able to choose what to do. And yeah. this is where, this is where we are. We're at the precipice of being able to choose what we have to do, but we can't be idiots like me and just take off the night vision glasses and go, "Oh well, that you know it doesn't exist," because then we're idiots. We're fools, you know. Yeah, it's the equivalent of taking a spoon, dipping it into the ocean, pulling it up, and saying, "There's no sharks or whales," you know, the yeah. same thing. And yeah. it's it's so true. We gotta. Be cautious of how we look at these things, and there's good and bad, but positivity and love raises a higher frequency. Fear sure. is a low frequency. Sure. And by us trying to understand these things and trying to show love for one another, maybe we can get to that point where we get into a frequency that maybe these other beings are in that frequency as mm-hmm. well. So you know, as we progress, as you're saying, and more people become aware, hopefully it can uh, guide us in the right direction. And yeah. we don't have the answers, but we're looking for them hard. Yeah. You know? And, it, and it, really, it really is about communication. There's some sort of communication going on. They, we are interesting enough. 
that there is some reason that we're being interfaced with or some reason that we're bumping up against this in all kinds of different aspects, NDEs, ghosts and spirits, angels and demons. There's a reason. There's a reason. And so what we need to do, we need to do is we need to be calm enough to make decisions to understand it. If we're always reactionary, then we're always going to be a slave to it. Mm-hmm. And, and we need to be able to participate. The only way to do that is to mature. Is to mature. That's yeah. great point because you can predict a reaction due to an action. You're calm in these situations. You're taking something away from that reaction. That's an that excellent is? point. Yeah. And almost like that other point you made. You know, like what what you're saying. Why do these things do the things they do? It's very much the same reasons we do the things we do. Look at us and our future plans for space. What we want to do, go to other planets, colonize it, study life forms, looking for new medicines and new things to help benefit our species. Maybe we go to an empty planet to get resources because we ran out of oil on ours. Same thing. Yeah, And I see, you sound like a very reasonable guy. But... You know, you try to put that in the framework that somebody else is doing that. Oh, then you're a lunatic. Wait a yeah. minute. How, how, does that, how does that work? How, you know, how can you be so smart and then turn into an idiot? Yeah. I, I, I just, and once again, it's, it's, it doesn't exist because I say it doesn't. I had an uncle. Well, I have an uncle who is a, a, an avowed atheist. And I mean, he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe the sun's up unless he opens his eyes, right? Okay, so he said he said to me once, he was arguing the point about there's absolutely nothing is a nihilist. And I said, really? I said, you know, that's kind of an arrogant kind of point of view. He says, well, if I don't believe, if I can't see it, I, I don't believe it. I said, well, I invite you to stand in front of an x-ray machine for about two weeks. Yeah. Because yeah. you're going you're gonna to be a sad fella. Because this thing that you don't believe in is going to have a drastic effect on you. A drastic yeah. effect. So I am not smart enough to deny all this stuff. What I'm saying is this, and this is why this film is the way it is. If you can think of it as, even though it says its answers, it's really just a bunch of open-ended questions. And my sincere, desperate attempt to try to get those answers, to try to get some sort of understanding and so I'm hoping that the audience can watch my trials and tribulations and say, oh, you know, that part makes sense. That part I can throw away. But I tell the same things to my kids. Look, I said, everything that I say, take the very best of it. The, the garbage, throw it out. It, it doesn't matter. Grain of salt. Grain of salt. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, uh, John, one question real quick. How yes, long sir. did it take you to make – the film Alien Abduction Answers. How long did you spend sure. making this? Sure. Estimate. I, th I think we shot for about three or four months. Um, it was broken up because we would shoot, we would edit, and then we would shoot we had three or four months. And I think we had a solid six months of editing. Wow. It took it took us almost a year. Wow. And and then I mean, you know, for people who don't understand how how you know it's called show business show is the little word business is the big word right so so the idea is that you have this project whatever it is and you want it seen by as many people as you can so you want it distributed right through all of the different mediums but to do that there are gatekeepers you know and the only way to get through those gatekeepers is to have a distribution deal i mean that's it you yeah. can't just walk up to disney and go hey by the way i'm a genius and you ought to do this because they yeah. laugh at you and, and security takes you off their property. Uh, I don't want to tell you a sad story about myself, <laughs> but uh, no, no, I no, never happened. Never happened to me. But throw out at Disney. All right. They, they threw me out. No, no. But what I'm saying is, is that you need, to, you need to do that, but to find a distributor and to negotiate it and try to get it done is very difficult. And we were blessed uh, our distributor is Virgil Films, and they've been in business for a really long time. And so right now, the film is distributed throughout North America. So Canada and the United States can all see it. And then uh, we're in negotiations right now to have it a worldwide distribution, but that won't happen until 
the end of autumn or, or winter, you know, before Christmas. All right. And, uh, but it'll be all, it's everywhere, you know, and if people are overseas and they're watching your podcast, they can still see it if they have a VPN, right. And they can still see it on Amazon or, or iTunes. And, um, and of course, amazon.com is selling the DVD, you know? Okay. Right yeah. on. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. And uh, yes, everyone, make sure that you go in the description. You will find all of John's information and the link to the video and a few other, his contact, et cetera, all down there. Make sure you check it out. And John, one thing, uh, I, I thought it would be a good way to kind of sum up everything we've been talking about and what you're doing. And as you were going over how like some people, they're really smart, intelligent people, and they just can't comprehend these bigger ideas. Let's go back to Nikola Tesla. I, uh, I always love to end things out on Nikola Tesla. It's impossible to give unlimited power to a limited mind. Uh, yeah. You'll blow it up. That, that's it. That's, that's it. it. That, that's it. That's and it. Uh, yeah, so John, thank you so much. Uh, incredible story. And trust me, everyone that's watching this, myself included, we understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, these experiences, it's a lifelong journey. And for most of us, it's a painful process. There would be nights where I would be with my band hanging out, you know, having a good time and I would bring it up and like start crying as a full grown yeah. man because people didn't believe in me. It's so frustrating yeah. not to have people believe in something that you witness sure. and you experience. So I just want to thank you for, you know, being so brave to speak up and to not only speak up gratifying your story and that, but actually to help other people get their stories out. That's so beautiful. And that's what it's all about. And I definitely know that you have a mission here on this planet and it's to do exactly what you're doing and just keep doing it. Don't give up on it. And uh, I know that there's great things in the work for all of us, including all the people that are watching this. So according yeah. to the message they gave you, Yes, we sir. have things to look forward to. And yes, sir. Patience, right, John? Well, think about it. you know you <laughs> see your you see your kids, you see your kids, they're born, and then you blink your eyes and they're in grade school. When you blink your eyes and they're graduating from high school, how did that happen? And they have their own kids, you know. Or you blink your eyes and you you used to be a young man, and then you blink your eyes and you're an old dying Whoa, guy. What, what? What's this? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I was bald yesterday. That's I don't know right, what right. happened. Like, <laughs> no, exactly. It's, it's patience. Know. It's yeah. patience and understanding. And sometimes it takes a lifetime to understand. And sometimes more than that. Sure. You're a wise man, Robert. I, I don't man. know nothing, buddy. I'm just as uh, wise as you, my friend. <laughs> yeah, you're, a wise, you're a wise man. And I thank you very much for your friendship. Thank you, sir. Yes, I appreciate it. So, yes, everyone, please make sure you check out Alien Abduction Answers. Truly incredible. It's like we are the disclosure, but a thousand times better. Hollywood production. It's like Steven Spielberg came over and made it himself. I know that's a really high up there, but compared to my videos, it is Steven Spielberg. It's really good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. And, and uh, it's absolutely incredible, very emotional, touching, and groundbreaking, in my personal opinion. And I highly recommend everyone go in the description, check that out. And we will see you all next time. Please make sure to hit that like button, share this, spread the word, tell everyone about John and his incredible story and spread it all over the interwebs so we can get this message out because this film does and will continue to inspire others to come forward and speak and at the end of the day that's exactly what the disclosure community needs because we all have a small piece of the puzzle the only way we understand the larger picture is by putting everyone's experiences together and then seeing what we got and going from there so 
John, once again, thank you so much, brother. Really appreciate it. Everyone have a wonderful night. I will see you next time. We are the Disclosure. Bye. Bye. Please join the YouTube membership for my channel. You will get exclusive badges, really awesome emojis, member-only live streams, posts, and chats, and connections with me for only $5.99 a month. See you there. Hey everyone, check out the Order of Light merchandise store. We got a lot of different t-shirts there. The humans aren't real. Low Railways Creek incident. We got tank tops and Merkaba. We got stickers, glasses, a lot of different glasses. So get thirsty. We got bags. I live in New Jersey. We don't have bags anymore. So it's really nice. We got flip-flops, hoodies, and all the ladies out there. We got a bunch of awesome merchandise for you.